So I'm, yeah, today going to introduce metaprogramming, um, the information in chapter 17. This is the slides from Josh Polkemhart. I don't know what cohort that was, but I uh, did some Super Bowl activities yesterday, so <laughs> did not spend a lot of time, sorry in advance. Okay, so here's the outline. We're gonna introduce metaprogramming, talk about code as data and code as trees, and then evaluation of code and then introduction to closures. Okay, so the prereq is that we will use Arlang um, because Hadley focuses on the tidy version of eval, we'll see later, instead of the base R um, scheme. And then we'll also use the lobster package again, which we have seen in the first section of the book to look at the trees. And here's a little lobster here. I think that, I don't know. That doesn't look like a natural color. <laughs> okay, what is metaprogramming? So metaprogramming is the idea that code is data that can be inspected and modified programmatically. Um, an example is when we don't need to quote packages when we use the library function, and then also how we can use formula notation in functions like GLM, and then and, and in those formula notations, right, sometimes you'll add together predictors, multiply, um, or use this colon to, uh, one of these includes the um, linear terms and one of these doesn't, I don't remember which is which, but. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're gonna focus on the tidy evaluation rather than base R to avoid some of the ambiguity in the legacy code. Okay, so the first thing that Hadley kind of introduces is this non-standard programming. So what is non-standard programming or non-standard evaluation? Uh, very roughly, it is to programmatically modify an expression or its meaning after it is is issued, but before it is executed. So for example, in the linear model, it has to take that expression for the formula and it has to um, use that before it can actually execute and run a, fit a model. Um, here's another example using the subset function. So this is um, R knows how to use this expression here, HP greater than 250 um, with this data frame empty cars. Um, and then it, it knows how to use this information at runtime. Um, rather than using this dollar sign notation. Okay. So Hadley um, complains that non-standard evaluation is sloppy definition for this behavior, basically because it's defining it based on what it's not, not what it actually is. And then um, R is one of the few languages that allows for this much flexibility and accessibility. And so the original author here put that Python is jealous of R, R's flexibility. So, or maybe they just confused. <laughs> okay. So why would we wanna use metaprogramming? So we have the ability to modify the meaning of code given context or inputs. Um, so this is extremely powerful. It also allows us to use many of the key features uh, in the tidyverse. And R does non-standard or does metaprogramming by design, so why not use its full power? So we got a Star Trek meme here, which I've never watched Star Trek, so I probably should have taken this out, but <laughs> maybe someone will appreciate it. Okay. Code is data. So the first section is about expressions. So we can capture code and compute on it like other types of data. And we do that by um, capturing it in an expression. We can use this function from Arlang, expr, and we just pass um, a function call essentially. And this is the print 
what it looks like when you print it. It just kind of looks like a character, but the class is a call. Okay, so an expression can be one of four types. So we just saw the call. This is representing captured functions. There's symbols, uh, which is names of an object. Scalar constants, so length one atomic vector, and or a pair list. Um, so I don't really remember much about this, but pair list is a legacy version of list used to store the arguments of a function. Um, and I believe later on, this is used more in the environment of a when you actually evaluate. This comes up. Okay. So and the one thing about expressions is it doesn't work with inside of a function. So here, if we want to have a function that turns some function call X into an expression, this will not work. So we see here, if we define this function, capture it, and we pass A plus B plus C, the expression function will only return X. So in order to capture the code in a function call, uh, we need to uh, have lazy evaluation. So we use this enriched expression function instead. So the enriched expression will actually lazily evaluate what's passed to it. I believe that is what this is saying. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, and now we can actually get what we get our argument that we um, past A plus B plus C. Okay. So just like other objects in R that are data, we might want to inspect or modify. So once we captured the code with either expression or enriched inspection, the enriched expression, we can interact with it like most data objects. This is an example from the book. So we can have this expression, which is F, and it has two arguments, X and Y. And so F, the first element of F is, um, I believe this, we should actually look at it, I don't remember, but the arguments start at slot two. So the first argument starts at slot two. So X is one, or we can also use the dollar sign notation to get the arguments. And you can also modify so we can add a new argument Z and assign it the value three. So now F is this expression with three arguments. And then the same thing with lists, you can remove an argument, this is in the book, by setting it to null. Um, and then I was looking a little bit into this and F is a base type, but I, I guess I'm a little confused because I guess it has names, which is an attribute. I don't remember, it doesn't have any attributes, but you can call the arguments by name. So it's a little interesting to me. Um, it's like in between a object and a base type almost. <laughs> okay. You're right about the first object being the function. It's just like a, expression that just has the function name as the first object. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks for checking that. Okay. So now we'll move on to the next section about um, code. It's not only data, it's a tree. Uh, so most programming languages represent code as a tree, often called the abstract syntax tree. So in the lobster package, we can view that tree using the AST function and it'll display the underlying tree structure. Function calls form the branches of the tree. So these dark blocks, I guess we're saying are branches. And then the arguments are th then the leaves, are uh, symbols and constants. So this function call F of A and B, we have the function branch here and then the two arguments. Um, and then this also works right for the um, functions, including the prefix form. So we have uh, two functions here, right? The plus and the 
multiplication and the plus comes first it looks like or wait sorry this is nested so this multiplication will be done first and then they'll be added together okay Okay, so we can also use code to generate new code or new trees. So there are two main tools. There's the call to function in Arling, um, and then the other two is unquoting. So call to constructs, constructs a function call from its components. So the first function to call and then the arguments to call it with. So call to will call the plus function with these two arguments. And then here we have a nested. So th this makes the previous tree a little more clear that we're multiplying first and then adding second um, to get the expression we had before, one plus two times three. And okay. Hopefully. Is there any questions about that? Okay. So another useful tool for code generating is this bang bang. So call to can be cumbersome for complex operations. An alternative is to build complex code trees by combining simpler code trees with a template. So you can use expression and enriched expression um, have built in support for this bang bang or the unquote operator. Unquoting allows you to selectively evaluate parts of the expression that would otherwise be quoted, which effectively allows you to merge the abstract syntax trees using a template abstract syntax tree. Okay. So basically, in this example, bang bang x will insert the code tree stored in x into the expression. So we have two expressions, xx and yy which is just x plus x and y plus y. Then in the expression, we will um, use the bang bang operator to combine these two components into one larger expression. And um, I wanted to actually show, I don't know if you guys have been looking at the, um, the companion. Okay, let me actually make this bigger. So they have a pretty interesting analogy where they say you can think of um, this bang bang as like performing surgery on the tree structure where you're replacing one node with another expression. So here we have A plus B. We saw this tree before. Here we're defining B as another expression, X plus Y. So when we use the bang bang, we're going to, um, you know, basically add this tree to this tree um, by replacing this second argument. Um, so they say here the forcing or the, the forcing operation is kind of like performing surgery on the trees where you cut one node, which would be this B, and you replace it with another tree or some other code. So I thought that was a good um, example that they had. Okay. Okay, so unquoting is even more useful when wrapped up into a function. So we can use enrich expression to capture the user's expression and then we can use expression and bang bang to create a new expression using that template, using a template. So here we might have a, a coefficient of variation function where the user might want to define the, um, this variable that we want to act actually, uh, let me see here. Yeah, I guess this would be the variable. So our variable is going to be captured with this enriched expression and then the expression will be the standard deviation of the variable over the mean of the variable. And so here we're having a 
coefficient of variation for x plus y. And this is our new expression down here. Okay. Capturing is also known as quoting and unquoting together make up the quasi quotation and this, uh, there's a summary slide at the end. I think this is the last chapter in the, this section. Uh, so quasi quotation makes it easy to create functions that combine code written both by the author, right? So this would be written by the author of the package and the, then the user. Okay, so we have these expressions. How might then we actually evaluate those expressions? Um, you can do that with the base eval function. Evaluating code relies on the expression and an environment that gives the symbols definition. So we had the coefficient variation for x plus y and in our environment, we define x and y and then we spits out a number. Okay, and I think I have a little note here. Um, I remember a long time ago doing like derivatives in R. I don't know if anyone else has, where you like pass a function and it'll give you a derivative and then you can pass values to that derivative expression. So I think, I don't know what R status is on like automatic differentiation, but I imagine this would be like pretty useful. Um, for something like that. Okay, so one advantage of evaluating code manually is that you can define the environment. And these are the two main reasons that Hadley gave um, for the advantages. And it's to, temp to temporarily override functions to implement domain specific language or to add a data mass. And I don't know about you guys, but he kind of listed these advantages, but then I, I couldn't really see like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I don't know if anyone else had that. Um, so maybe the rest of the chapter will like give more light on these two things, but uh, a data mask is an environment containing user supplied objects. Objects in the mask have precedence over objects in the environment, i.e. they mask those objects. So we'll see, I think, in a couple slides, um, the tidy eval, how it uses a data mask and a environment. Okay, so this is custom function. So this is um, an example for that first advantage. So in the last example, we had those random vectors X and Y, and um, we can also bind names to functions. So Here's an example where we might wanna override the behavior of existing functions plus minus and multiply to work with characters. So we define um, this function string math and in a, an environment E, we're going to override the plus minus and multiply. And then we will evaluate whatever user supplied expression within this new environment E. So the plus will just paste the two strings together. The minus will replace, basically delete whatever character you are subtracting and the multiply will repeat the strings. So what are we gonna add? We're gonna add power. And so we have more power and then here we first subtract y from x, y, z, and then we repeat x, z three times. It's the multiply. Um, and I guess this might be a point discussion is, when do you guys think it would be an advantage to do something like this, where I guess you have locally overridden functions in the function environment versus just defining like a string add, string minus, string multiply in like your global. I guess it's more concise for this example to just have minus and multiply, but I don't know. Does anyone have any thoughts about that? Has anyone done anything like this? 
Um, well, I mean, like when you write a function, sometimes an argument in there, you want to call it data and data is already a function. So you overwrite it inside the, inside the function. Mm -hmm. um, overwriting primitives, I don't really know that you would ever need to do that really, <laughs> but well, yeah. I just mean like, like if, if I, based on what I know before reading this, I would basically just have three new functions that I just call like string add, string minus, and string multiply that I would use whenever, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it, I don't know. I guess it might look a little funny being like X, Y, Z minus or <laughs> X, Y, Z string minus Y. Yeah. Yeah. Um, since those have, you know, kind of infix, their infixes, and they fit with people's logical understanding of what they're going to do in that mm -hmm. format. So maybe, okay. maybe that, like, I guess when you're like writing an infix that does something different, it might make sense. Yeah. I don't know, does anybody else have any ideas? I kind of was, um, caught up on like the fact that he said the like the main reason one of the main reasons is to implement not just like a function or like a new behavior for existing functions but like to implement a domain specific language and I feel like maybe like use the use of the term language is significant because at least in this case all of the kind of like new behaviors for operators are like coherent they like constitute I guess like a new language um, mm -hmm. for dealing with like strings um, and mm -hmm. so I guess you could make individual functions for all of them or you can kind of package multiple functions or like objects or names or whatever um, that you would use for like a particular mm -hmm. you know task like dealing with strings um, okay. and maybe in that case wrapping it in an environment is like nice since you can just yeah store that in like like here, like in the name E, and then just keep calling it over and over. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Um, moving on. So this cus uh, let me see what is another application is modifying evaluation to look for variables in a data frame instead of an environment. So this is the data mask idea. This powers the aesthetic in ggplot2 and the mutate in dplyr. It's possible to use the eval function for this, but it's less user-friendly, so we're going to now switch to the tidy eval. So the main difference between eval tidy is that it takes an expression environment and a data mask, where eval only takes um, an expression and an environment and yeah and an enclosure but we didn't talk about that really um, in this chapter so we have a data frame with x and y and when we evaluate it tidily when we evaluate this expression x plus y we provide a data mask which is this data frame and then in our environment we also have x is 11 to 15 so as we mentioned before anything in the data mask takes precedence. So when this expression is evaluated, it looks first here in data frame. So we have one through five, um, and then plus a vector of ones. So two, we get this two, three, four, five, and six. Whereas if we use the, um, uh, there's an example on the next page, I think, okay. And so then to ensure that we're using the right variables that we want, you can also um, use dot data and dot environment to specify where you want the expression to be, what object you want the expression to use. So here we're specifying, oh wait, we actually wanna use X in the environment. So we get uh, 12 to 16. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, the last bit is on closures. So we can see an issue with our environments in this example. We would like our function to operate in such a way that it uses A that the user has access to and not this A within the function that's hidden from the user. So we have data frame one to three and A is 10. So we would like this X plus A to be plus 10, but it actually uses the 1000 in the function environment. So we can solve this by using a closure, which will bundle together an expression X plus A with an environment. The name is a portmanteau of quoting and closure because the closure both quotes the expression X plus A and encloses the environment. Closures solidify the internal promise object into something that you can program with. Okay, so how this would work is instead of using enriched expression, um, we're going to use this enclosure function. And so now when we do X plus A, we get 11, 12, and 13. Um, and I guess, I don't really know the, this, does anyone know like how this knows? It's inside the function, but it's bundling expression with the global environment, I would guess. Yeah. I don't, yeah, okay. I'm wondering, like I'm wondering if, if you did define a variable inside the environment that you do want to use in a user supplied expression that is not defined in the global environment that the user like passed the expression in from, will mm -hmm. it find that variable in the function environment or will it not be able to find it when you're using an enclosure? Yeah, I guess what, what would you want the behavior to be? An error probably, right? So or... like, what if you did, well, I'd wanted to evaluate it. If it like didn't find it in the user's environment, I wanted to uh, fall back on the internal environment. Mm -hmm. Like if it was like, like if you didn't have a defined and you had that same function Will it use uh, will it use a I'm gonna test that. Yeah, you should test it out. Okay. And then yeah, this is like the last slide, so um this last slide is just saying we're gonna see more of this in the following chapter. So Next week, we're gonna keep talking about expressions and how they act like data. Chapter 19 is more on quasi-quotation. Oh, so that was one off. <laughs> and then the last chapter is more about um, evaluation and customization. So I suppose a lot of these discussions will have better understanding in the coming weeks. Yeah. That's it. It was a short one. So the answer is no. It does not fall back on the function environment. Hmm. Well, I wonder if there's a way to like mess with the environment on a closure. Like, I wonder if you could 
like take the closures environment inside the function and like add the function environment as its parent such that it you know has that precedence functionality where it's going to use the closure environment first and then it's going to use the parent environment second I don't know. <laughs> See if this works. Um, well, I hung my R session. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, I guess you weren't supposed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Next, you will get a blue screen if you're using Windows. I'm trying to force it. No blue screen yet, thankfully. It has not boarded, it's just like hung, just hung up. It's not doing anything. Mm. I tried to set the internal function environment as the parent of the environment that was, it's like an attribute of, an, of a closure. Mm. And it just froze. Because I'm trying to, like, there's a use case 
that I'm trying to do with like a web socket to allow people to pass in their own function or not function, but code. They can pass in their own code and it'll evaluate using the stuff in their own environment. Mm -hmm. And it will also evaluate with a couple of objects that are inside the web socket that I created. Like it's definitely like the use case they describe allowing people to write code that interacts with already written code. Um, I'm just wondering how to, how to merge the two. Anybody have any experience with this? No. <laughs> I just killed my R session. Okay, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's interesting though. We have like um, our one of our grants. We have like put all our data together in like this data library, and it has yeah, like you can code online to subset and plot, the but it's like some weird. It's like called Ingrid, I think. Mm -hmm. the lang the language so <laughs> but i think they're going to switch it to python soon the language is called ingrid yeah huh never heard of that i don't think anyone uses it <laughs> <laughs> i think like only these data live i don't know it might be like custom oh huh. Maybe it's like some derivative on Julia. Like no, the, it's generalization of something else I've never heard of. Summary, S-U-M-R-Y. I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> yeah, totally clueless there. Oh, I think it's something also talks about. Hmm. I don't know. Try this in two steps and maybe it won't freeze my, uh, my session this time. I wasn't playing around with the dot like invent dot data pronouns like just now. Um, and it looks like you can call them inside the player verbs, which is kind of nice. So if oh, you have cool. like um, in the global environment, if you um, say something like uh, set the name MPG to like minus one, and if you like, Um, if you like make a new column named X that's like 10 times MPG, that MPG will refer to the column MPG. But if you wanted to refer to the global environment MPG, then you can do the dot in um, pronoun. And then this will evaluate MPG with respect to um, its value in the global environment. Uh, whereas like the regular way is the same as doing dot data. Um, and then 
Mm. MPG. This is useful because mm. I've like accidentally oh. named things in my global environment with the same name as like column names and in filter mm. it like <laughs> it doesn't yeah. like it if I'm like year less than year <laughs> okay interesting so the the ends will come from the calling environment and data will be from the actual data frame right right cool yeah Kind of interesting. Um, and also the way I like figured this out uh, was, I don't know if y'all know this, but you can call browser like the debugging function inside of like pass it to like any environment where it will get evaluated. So if you do like mutate and then the right hand side is like browser then you will, it will like debug inside of like the verb mutate. Um, and so once you get to this point and like the browser pops up, um, you can type like dot data and then it'll like give you, oh, it's a pronoun. pronoun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this was actually really handy for me when I was learning um, data table because you can just um, pass uh, browser to the J um, and it'll make it more transparent about like what you're actually doing in there because data table kind of gets really compact and complicated, but yeah. Yeah, that's super useful if you are like using a function that you don't really understand how it's passing in arguments. Like per was really, I didn't know what was going on inside of like per functions and sticking a browser in there and then going in there and using like ls with all names to see like what all the variables are that are floating around that you can use that's like super useful yeah i never i don't think i've ever used browser <laughs> very convenient i don't know like when do you use it how do you use how do you it? not use browser yeah i think i use I it <laughs> Almost every time something gets wrong, I think it's not like super complicated to use, but you just have to know like when it will get evaluated in like the global environment versus not. So like, I think in cases of like mutate, um, you don't evaluate the right hand side until later, which is like the same logic um, of why you can throw in like uncoded MTG and it's not gonna say like, I can't find any because it's gonna be evaluated in like a special environment. So like, you know, the browser is gonna be in that environment, like passed along to that environment until it gets evaluated. So you'll have access to that. Um, but sometimes like just throwing in browser um, inside of a function doesn't work. It might get evaluated in the global environment instead. Um, so I guess it's just knowing um, if your browser call will actually get called inside of the function that you want to debug uh, versus if that's just gonna evaluate before um, it gets inside the function. Yeah, but you can also do like, I think this often works for me. Um, say um, something like this, um, where you enclose the browser call inside like um, the curly bracket. Mm -hmm. um, that, yeah, that sometimes gets it through. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, browser is like so essential at a certain point in time. There's some things that are just like impossible to figure out how to debug without browser. Well, I'm sure in the next section I will learn how to do more about that. Oh, uh, I think I figured out why I was crashing my R session. So when you're like in, yeah, I don't know. In this browser, how do you use it? Um, June, do you wanna? Yeah, I can, <laughs> I can show you like the way I was using the dot data dot info thing. Um, all right, I can share my screen, that's good. Um, yeah. 
Yes. Can you all see my our session? Yeah. All right. So, um, I just have. Um, so say MPG is minus one. Um, this is definitely not 10 times minus one or negative one. Um, they said, if I wrap this in environment, it fetches the value from the environment. If I put browser in here, what it'll do is it will go into like this, I guess like new console thing um, where you're debugging inside of the dplyr verb. Um, you know this because you can throw in like uncoded names like HP, we haven't declared that in the global environment, uh, but that's gonna fetch the column from uh, empty cars. So mm -hmm. browser is being called in like the special environment um, with the data masking. Um, what's cool is if you type LS, like nothing shows up. So like HP is here, but like HP isn't in, like it's not shown by LS. Um, you can do this thing called all names equals true um, which basically just prints, like by default, LS doesn't show names that start with a dot because those are like special, um, I guess. And it'll be like kind of crowded if it always did. If you do all names equals true, you'll see that like data environment and top in are available. These are um, like all the pronouns that we talked about. Um, and so if you look at dot data, it's actually just like this thing of class pronoun. <laughs> Um, which doesn't even have any like, like structure. You can't, I don't know, what can you, it's not like storing any information except um, you can still access it like you would the actual data frame, but it's just like a different type. Mm. Um, so like this still works. And then .inv is the same. So this isn't actually the environment as far as I know. Like this doesn't have the stuff associated with, like I can't do something like find everything in dot in. There's nothing, but it works like a the data mask. So we can call MVG from the environment and it returns this variable. Um, yeah, so that's what I was playing around with. I don't like understand this 100%, but insofar as browser goes, it's really useful if you just do browser inside of um, like dplyr verbs or like per verbs um, or like really anywhere else. Um, and then like the very first thing I do from here is like ls. Um, and I try to do like repeat whatever thing I did that made it fail um, mm -hmm. and then see what went wrong in there. Yeah. So if I, yeah, did something like this and I didn't expect that, I expected it to return. Um, use the global environment MPG, then I can like make sure that this is actually what I want and then like go back and then type this in instead. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, very easy. I don't think you can really, there's no risk <laughs> to using browser. Um, so I like fail a lot when I use the browser call, but um, yeah, it's worth a try if you're stuck. Yeah. I, yeah, it was a revelation. That, and when you told me about recover, that was a revelation too. And just like start using it every single day from then on. <laughs> I think this is gonna work. I think I might've figured this out. Nope. All right, I think I'm, I'm leaving now. Thanks for presenting and take care everyone. See yeah. you next week. <laughs> Bye. Bye.